بخوام یک بخوام از عیسی مسیح بگم بعد یه خورده برگردم عقب من قبل از عیسی مسیح ده دوازده سال بدون خدا زندگی کردم و احساس میکردم که هیچ مشکلی ندارم همه چیز خوبه با توانمندی های خودم با قدرت خودم با تفکر خودم میتونم به هر چیزی که میخوام دست پیدا بکنم و قبل تر از اون میتونم بگم همه راهی رفتم دیگه الان چهل سالمه تو این نقطه چهل سالگی برمیگم به عقب رو نگاه میکنم میبینم که یک مسیری رو تهیه کردم با یک روح ناآرام یک روح متلاطم هیچ وقت آرامش نداشتم همیشه به دنبال یک چیزی میگشتم که خودم نمیدونم چیه و این گذشت تا پیام انجیل رو زمانی که شنیدم واسه بیشتر یک فان بود یک تفریح بود ببینید عیسی مسیح که میگه عیسی مسیح چی میگه مسیحیت چی هستم وارد مسیحیت شدم توی ایران خیلی چیزها جرمه داشتن این کتاب میتونه ده سال زندانی به همراه خودش داشته باشه شاید کمتر شاید بیشتر و با توجه و مشکلاتی که بود در نهایت ما از ایران خارج شدیم و آمدیم ترکیه توی ترکیه سری تجربه های جدید اولین تجربه من تو کلیسای ساختمان با جماعت زیاد جماعت مسیحی اولین تجربه من توی ترکیه بود زمانی که وارد شدم خب یک تجربه جدید اما روح تمسخر تو وجود من بود این ادامه داشت تا زمانی که خیلی خیلی به طور خاص قلبم لمس شد زمانی که این اتفاق افتاد قلب در گناه بودم خودم رو آزار میداد اطرافیانم رو آزار میداد و میخوام بگم اعتراف کنم که اگر مادری به اسم ماریا نمیامد تو زندگی من و از خدا واسه من نمیگفت نمیدونم شاید الان حتی مرده بودم شاید الان تو زندان بودم شاید هزار اتفاق دیگه که تصورش واسه خیلی سخته بود اتفاق میافتاد ترکیه اولش خدا رو شکر میکنم با خاطر اینکه حالا در نهایت حالا چیزایی که میخوام بگم خیلی شاد خوشایند نباشه خیلی جاهاش ولی در نهایت به خاطر سرزمینی که به هر حال کلیسای خدا اونجا آزادانه داره نام خدا رو زبون میاره و داره پرستش خدا رو میکنه اما ترکیه زندگی خیلی سخت بود جاهای من کار کردم که زمانی که فهمیدن من مسیحی هستم و گفتم مسیحی هم توف کردن تو صورتم جاهایی بود که کم محل شدن، جاهایی بود که با هم پرخاشگری شد، جاهایی بود که مثلا فهمیدن مسیحی هم شاید من هم دارن کارهای پست رو مثلا میدن که انجام بدی فقط با خاطر اینکه توهین میکنم، خاطر اینکه شخصیت رو زیر سوال برم، احساس منیم مادرم با کلیسای کستال چورچ رفت آمد داشت بعد به برادر فریبوز گفته بود، اونجا هم دیگر رو دیده بودم و زمانی بود که بعدها من فهمیدم اینا همه نقشه خدایی. دیگه خسته شد دادم دیگه یعنی دیگه طاقت نداشتم دیگه اون تنهایی و اون قربت رو تصمیم تصمیم گرفتم که پناهندگیم رو تبدیل به اقامت کنم گفتم دیگه نهایتا همین ترکیه میمونم همون زمانی که نه همون یکی دو روزی که من یعنی واقعا داشتم میرفتم که این کارو بکنم برادر فری برز به من زنگ زد که ما این مدارک شما می‌خوایم مدارک رو بفرست ما می‌خوام شما رو اسپانسر بشیم و بیاریم اینجا به من گفتن که واو بعد وقتا صبح که چشم رو باز میکنم هنوز باورم نمیشه که رسیدم کانادا یک آرزوی محال بود یک آرزوی دور بود اولین باری که رفتم توی کلیسا خیلی عجیب بود بعد احساس میکردم که خب حالا من آمده میشه من یه قطره کوچیک از این جماعت زیادی که اینجا هستن قطعا کسی من نمیشه کسی حواسش به من نیست شد برادر فری بارس که ما رو دیده و میشنست بعد دیدم که همه دعا کردن بعد زمانی که گفتن که من جز اون اولین خانواده ای هستم که رسیدیم اینجا یکی یکی آمدند خوش آمد گفتن دست من رو فشار دادن من رو در آمیش گرفتن و با لبخم با مه با محبت این کار کردن تشکر کنم ازشون برکت بتنم ازشون که از اون جایی که نکاشتند درو کنم و دعا کنم که خودم جانم مالم قوتم برای جلال بخشیدن به نام قدوس خدا و برای خوشنودی خدا صرف بشه آمین واو 
What a powerful story that Vahit and his family have shared with us. And uh, I want to thank you, Coastal Church, for being a loving church, for being a giving church, uh, both to Vahit and his family and so many other projects that are going on from gifts to prisoners this year to helping at Alexander House, Hoi House, Veteran Manor, and loving your neighbor. That's what it's all about. Christmas is all about hope. Christmas is about Jesus coming to this world to give us hope, to give us life. And I think that was uh, the plan for Vahit and his family is to hope for a better life and perhaps even, could we say, a wonderful life. At Christmas time, I think of that movie. It's one of my favorite Christmas movies, and that was A Wonderful Life. How many else out there today and watching online enjoy the movie It's a Wonderful Life? Anybody else? I see a lot of hands out there. It's a wonderful life. Early on in the movie, there's a particular scene that I, uh, really struck me, and that's when Clarence the angel is being talked to by his superior about a fellow who needs a lot of help, George Bailey. And so he, Clarence uh, asks his superior, what is it? Is he sick? And his superior says, no, it's worse than that. He's discouraged. That's a revealing line because discouragement or the lack of hope is worse than a physical illness. A few years ago in the magazine Psychology Today, Dr. Dale Archer had this statement, if I could find a way to package and dispense hope, I would have a pill more powerful than any antidepressant on the market. And there's a great need for hope in our world today. There's a need for hope in so many different areas. And so I want to talk to you about hope this morning because Christmas, after all, it's all about hope. It's about a time to bring light into the darkness. We've been pretty resilient, I think, this past year as a world, even as a province of British Columbia. I think we've tried hard. We've tried hard to work with all the mandates and all the star stops and starts, and we, we just tried really hard. But you know what? We're not wired for constant disruption and changes and uncertainty, and we need an anchor to hold us in times like this. In the eighth century, Long before Jesus arrived, as a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes in a manger, the prophet Isaiah predicted that he would come. And this is what Isaiah had to say. He said, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And then about 800 years later, of course, Jesus arrived. That's what we've been singing about, celebrating. That's what Christmas is about. Luke, in his gospel, records a Christmas story. And in his account, he emphasizes a couple of things. You'll see these words pop out. He emphasizes joy, goodwill, and peace. And so this is what Luke has to say, Luke chapter 2. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, watching over their flock by night. Behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. I guess that includes you and me this morning. Everybody here at the Queen Elizabeth Theater, everybody watching online is for all people. All people, for there's born to you. So it's very personal. It's for everybody, but it's also for you personally. Born to you this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You'll find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. This is Christmas. God coming to earth. Emmanuel. Jesus lived on this earth showed us what the Father was like, showed us what God was like. Then He died for our sins, and He rose again. Powerful story, what Christmas is. He came to, to give us hope. He came to give us a way out. This kingdom that He set up was for our hearts. Jesus didn't come to set up an earthly kingdom. 
would have looked a lot different if he had, I suppose, but his kingdom was a spiritual kingdom inside of our hearts. Certainly, when you look back over history, has there always been peace since Jesus came? No. Has there always been joy? No. Has there always been goodwill? No. So, what were these angels talking about? They were talking about something in our heart. And when we have this connected in our heart, it's an inside job. It starts from the inside and it works out. That's what changes the world. That's what makes the world a better place when it's inside of our heart. So, let's talk about hope. I've got these letters here behind me, and there's somebody sitting beside each letter, and I'll get to them in just a moment. You might be wondering, what are they doing there? You'll find out in just a moment. Let me tell you what hope is not. First of all, hope is not wishful thinking. On your birthday, perhaps you get a birthday cake, and they put some candles on that birthday cake, and uh, then, then you get to make a wish, and you blow the candles. And when you're making that wish, you maybe say, oh, I hope I have a healthy year, or I hope I have happiness this year. That's not really hope. That's wishful thinking. Because there's a lot of things beyond our control this year that might affect us. So that's wishful thinking. Hope is also not blind optimism. It's good to be an optimistic person, but blind optimism is seeing everything through rose-colored glasses. Blind optimism is when you paper over all the problems of the world and you just pretend like everything's going to be okay. You have no control over it, but you just say, it's all going to be okay. 1989, a salesman who was selling computers was on his way back to Chicago. He was on a flight. At Christmas time, a lot of people are flying right about now. Well, he was on a flight to Chicago, sitting near the back in an aisle seat, and he was reading his book. He's on a DC-10, that's a three-engine plane, two engines on the wing, one engine on the back. And as he's flying along, he hears this loud bang, and the whole plane begins to shudder. What had happened was the rear engine blew, blew up, and it destroyed some of the hydraulic systems in that plane, making it very difficult to fly. He said on that plane, people began to scream. Some people were just shaking uncontrollably. And then there were some with blind optimism. They were saying to their neighbors, it's going to be okay. It's okay. No worries. It's okay. But they had no control over the situation. Jeff is a Christian, and in that moment, he, he prayed. And his prayer was something like this. God, I don't want to die, but if I die, I pray that you would take care of my family. I know that I'm going to heaven because I have a promise that if I accepted Christ as my Savior, my sins are paid for, that I would be with you in heaven, and he prayed a very simple prayer. Now, obviously, Jeff lived because he told the story. That plane crashed in Sioux Falls, Iowa. It was a bad landing. A lot of people died in it. And Jeff found himself hanging upside down by his seatbelt in a cornfield. And he said, wow, I'm actually okay. His friend asked him later, what was it like on that plane? He said, it, it, was, it was scary. I have to tell you, it was scary. But inside, I felt okay because I had a hope connected, linked to God. And I knew that if I died, I knew He'd take care of my family. I knew that I would go to heaven, and I knew if I survived, it would be okay. So I had a hope that kept me in that time. That wasn't wishful thinking. It wasn't some blind optimism. It was a real hope. Now, that tells us something about hope. What is hope? Hope is connected to something that's alive. Hope is a real hope. It's, it's a living hope. It's something that is well, let me put Hebrews 10, 23 on the screen here for you. It says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for God who promised is faithful. Let us hold. See, for a lot of people, hope is just something they do. I hope for this or I hope for that. Now, catch this difference. This is important. Hope is something real that you actually hold on to or you profess or you can grab. Hope is something that you can keep with you. For the believer, for Jeff, hope is this confident expectation that God is able and willing to do what He's promised He would do. See, in that plane, 
Hope wasn't just something that Jeff was saying, oh, I hope I'm going to be okay. No, hope was actually connected. It was anchored to something stronger than him. That's what Christmas is about. We've lived in some challenging times this last couple of years, and more than ever, our world needs hope as we go into 2022. And hope is connected, anchored into what God has done for us. God is real, and His, His power is real. But not only, does, not only is God's power real, God sees you today. Everybody watching online, God, God sees right where you are. Not only does God see us, God cares about us. Not only does He care about us, He wants to help you. The Bible says His eye is on the sparrow, so He really cares about you. He sees what we're going through, and He asks us, He says, I extend this towards you. I'm asking you to link your, your, your trust into me. Denzel Washington is a very famous actor. We all recognize him. And uh, he, he had this quote. He said this just a few weeks ago. As a Christian man, I thought it was a powerful statement. He said, if you don't have a spiritual anchor, you'll be easily blown by the wind and you'll be led to depression. He's got a lot of life experience and he, he knows that you have to be anchored to something. Your hope has to be connected to something. For some people, they connect their hope to themselves. It's all about what I can do. For some people, their, their hope is in their money. My money will solve all my problems. For some people, their hope is in science. For some, their hope is in the government. But God is saying, place your hope in me. That's what Jesus came for, was so that we could put our hope in Him. As I mentioned, we have these letters behind us here, and uh, we're going to do an acronym today, and each one of these letters will represent one of the promises that God has for us. And so I asked four volunteers to come and share their stories. We're having a lot of stories in our grand service today, and we're doing that for a reason. As I think we need to know that God is working and moving in the lives of people. He's no respecter of person. God is alive, and He's giving people hope today and all the challenges that they have. So, I'm going to go over to letter H, and I'm so glad to introduce Kim Gall. Would you give her a big welcome here this morning? <laughs> Kim, thank you for being here. Kim is originally from Nigeria, I believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're standing beside the letter H, and H stands for the promise of health, spiritual health, emotional health, and also physical health. Mm -hmm. So, Kim, I know that God was really with you this year, and He spoke to you from some promises, mm -hmm. and uh, tell us a little bit what happened in, in your life this year. Oh, dear. I'm <laughs> going to give the cliff notes, the cliff quick notes summary, okay. so we're going to just get to it. On July 4th, it was, I was sleeping and it was about 3, 4 a.m. I don't know, I just woke up and I had uh, Psalm 23 verse 4 in my heart. So we all know Psalm 23, but I didn't know what exactly verse 4 was. So I grabbed my phone and I looked it up and it said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for God is with me. His rod and his staff will comfort me. So I wasn't going through anything. I was like, I don't know what this is about, but I just prayed and I went back to sleep. I got to church a few hours later and then Pastor Dave got on the stage and he's like, today we're going to read from Psalm 23 verse 4. <laughs> and I was just like, oh my gosh. Like, I started crying. <laughs> I, I went to, pass, um, to Pastor James' wife, Michelle. I was like, can you imagine? Like, this just happened. And she prayed with me, like, whatever it is, you know, God will reveal Fast forward to a month, I found myself in the hospital. I was bleeding internally. The doctors didn't know what was going on. Day after day, my platelet count, it was very low. It couldn't, wasn't coming up. My life group every day were praying for me. My best friend, my parents, everybody was praying. But on the outside, there just wasn't any hope. I mm. didn't. And on the Tuesday, a particular Tuesday night, I couldn't sleep. I was tossing and turning, and I was so afraid. Yeah. The fear was tangible. Hmm. And somehow my faith, it was just at the back. Like I couldn't, I was just so afraid. And then Susie from my life group sent me this prayers. And I had it in my ear. I was listening to it on repeat. I heard the testimony of Best, um, Betty Baxter. If you haven't heard, just look for it. And I was so encouraged. And at that time I remembered that a month ago, God gave me a word. Right. 
And I found my hope was in that, that he remembered me. Because you were in the valley of the shadow of death. <laughs> and I didn't even know that it was coming. Yeah. And I just found so much like comfort. It just, it felt like a, like a hug, like a, a warm blanket. Like he just, he gave me that because hmm. of that time. And so I was, I just drew comfort in that and something changed. Then I went to bed and in the morning I had another word and it was James 5, 14. If any is sick among you, he should uh, reach out to the elders of the church to pray and anoint him. I was like, I don't even know any elders. <laughs> uh, we had just moved to Maple Ridge. I didn't really know anybody, so I just met Pastor Kevin a week prior. So I just sent him a message. I was like, hi, I don't know if you remember me. I'm Cam. I know you're really busy, but if you can, can you just come and pray with me? And so he came with Garrett, who's the, our life group leader, and we were in the parking lot at the Maple Ridge uh, Hospital. I was in my hospital gown and my IV pole. <laughs> Outside. <laughs> Outside. Oh, wow. And he came with a bottle of olive oil. Like, again, on the outside, it just seems like olive oil. But we had faith and we had a hope in God that it didn't matter what we had, that he was going to be there. And so we stood outside and we linked hands and we prayed. And honestly, my platelet count, that it, was, it went from zero to 18 to 68. And today, it's at 225. Wow. <laughs> So I'm so thankful. And so my hope wasn't wishful thinking, and it, wasn't, it was in that word that God gave, because he gave it for a reason and for such a time as that. So wow. I'm so thankful. Cam, that's such a great story. You know what I like is how the Holy Spirit ahead of time prompted you with these promises. Yeah. And, and when you needed them, they were there, and your, your soul had an anchor you know, because a lot, of, a lot of the battle we have is in between our ears. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and like you say, you know, there was that challenge just to believe in that time. Yeah. But hope has an anchor, and your anchor was in, in those promise of God. So yeah. thank you for sharing this morning. Really of appreciate course. it. Give Kevin another big hand for being brave, coming on stage and sharing today. Thank you. All right, I'm going to walk over to the letter O, and uh, the letter O means to overcome. You know, in Christ, we're more than conquerors, and He helps us overcome the challenges of life. And Andrew Simbaya uh, is with us today. Andrew, I know that you had overcome some huge challenges coming to uh, our country and even having your, your family get here. So maybe share how God has helped you and what verse you were anchored to. I remember from the Word of God, the Bible says, everyone born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory which overcomes the world, even our faith, as in John chapter, 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. So this is the scripture which was encouraging me, and uh, relocating to a new country uh, seems exciting when you are preparing to, to do that. You are committed, you are fighting everything, you are until when visa is granted. Now, landing into Canada, Reality set in that I'm actually alone here. I don't know anyone. Uh, I need to find my way out. Uh, so that with the COVID restriction, the lockdowns, you, you, you can't meet anyone. So it, those things started like weighing me down uh, until the time when I got an apartment through a church member of Costo and he introduced me to this church. Then I joined the life group, and uh, it's easier to say you are a strong believer when you are in the crowd, but when you right. are alone, you realize that you need people. Come so on. the life group helped me to overcome a lot of challenges, a lot of uncertainties. And our leader, Kelvin, the brothers there, Wesley, they helped me through and through uh, getting my first part-time job. All those things also, when time to came to bring my family in Canada. There was, you know, government used to change immigration. Right. Right, and they, today they say this, you think, the other day they say, now you need to stand on something, and the word of God 
which should give you strength and uh, the same scripture I mentioned to overcome the uncertainties and uh, fear of saying maybe the visas won't be granted. We kept praying, the service group, the life group kept praying with me. Also, the pastors here kept praying with me. That's how if my family managed to come here and we overcome all that fear and everything that came our way. And uh, you know, you have such an amazing story, and really it's a story too of how, you know, the church family came around and helped you. We need, like you said, to be connected with others. But I, I was just struck by Andrew's story because I, you came from Kenya, correct? No, Zambia. Zambia, okay. <laughs> Zambia. Came from Zambia. Uh, comes from Zambia and lands here. You have to quarantine yes. and by yourself. You don't know anybody in the country. Just the, the loneliness. And I think maybe people watching online today, you feel very lonely and feel disconnected. But you, ha you, had, a, you had an anchor in God. And that uh, this is a victory that overcomes the world. And you, you were here in this world and you, were, you felt so alone. Now, your wife is not back yet from Zambia, right? She's arriving next week or? On Tuesday. On she Tuesday. She came over with the children, then she went back. So she's coming. So the story continues to evolve. You're, you're still anchored to, to hope yes. and, and looking forward to her coming back. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, we really appreciate your story, Andrew. And I think for all of us out there, there's times we all feel lonely. There's times we all feel so isolated. But God says, I don't want you to be alone. Don't be lonely in the city, we often say. And that's one of the reasons we have life groups is to help people find community. So thank you, Andrew, for sharing. Give thank Andrew a big hand thank again. You. Thank Great story. I'm going to move over to the letter P. Now, this guy's no stranger to you. You know Pastor Chris Garahije and uh, Yale Town Campus Pastor. So, by the way, how far is Yale Town Campus from here? It's just three blocks from here. Three blocks. Yeah, three blocks from so here. At, so, at the Park Marriott. That's right. Sign yeah. is at 11 o'clock. If you're in the area, I would love to have you. And it's Shameless it. plug from a <laughs> campus pastor. <laughs> that's what we do. We'd love to have you join us Absolutely. there. Absolutely. So yeah. the letter P stands for provision. We refer to Psalm 23, Cam did, and part of Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And you have a powerful story, Chris. Uh, you put it into a book form, Royal Refugees, which is a great read. I'd encourage people to pick that up. But your, your family saw God provide in a very, very dark time. Your hope was in Him. Tell us a little bit about that. Thank you, Pastor Dave. Um, a number of years ago, our family um, miraculously escaped uh, what would later be known as one of the worst uh, tragedies in modern history and the genocide of my people uh, in Rwanda, Africa. Um, and um, to give you an idea of how bad it was in, in a country that's the landmass, the size of the lower mainland, mm. a little bit smaller than that, um, a million people were killed. And, uh, men, women, and children were slaughtered in, in just three, three months. Um, it was six people every minute of mm. every hour of every day were killed for a hundred days, and and um, so are my, my relatives. About I lost about eighty percent of our relatives, family, uh, including my father, wow. uh, passed away. Uh, were, were killed in the genocide, um, and uh, eventually, five of us kids and my mom managed to escape. Um, and I really believe it was because our hope was anchored on something different, something mm. else. Because uh, everything we tried to put, everything we could have put our hope in failed us. Mm. From government intervention to, to friends who we thought could maybe hide us and, and keep us away from the killers. Everything failed but God. Wow. It was God. Um, and we found our hope in Psalm 91, a verse that really became the anthem for our life. Um, in verse 5 and 7, verse 5 says, You shall not be afraid of the terror that, that, that surrounds at night, that stalks at night. And there was so much fear there, so much fear. But he said, You shall mm. not be afraid. And he said, verse 7 said, A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand. Well, that was happening. There was hundreds of thousands being killed every, every week for weeks. But it, the scripture said, It shall not come near us. Wow. And I would wake up at night and I would hear voices and it was my mom praying that over every child. 
that destruction will not come near you. Wow. Um, and that's what kept us alive, through going through checkpoints where everybody was being stopped and turned around, and we somehow managed to get through, through being surrounded literally by tens of, of people around our car trying to get in, and, and we were able to get through because our hope was founded on, on something wow. different. Um, and so we're alive for that. When I think of provision, I, I think of how the hope provided for us, provided refuge for us when we were refugees. Mm -hmm. uh, it provided provision for us and finances for us when we had lost everything that we knew, everything my parents had built. Um, it provided family for us coming here to Canada eventually and, and being here, something that we didn't think was possible. But because our hope was in him, on, on something, on an anchor, as you mentioned, uh, we're alive today because of that very hope. Wow, yeah. that is such a powerful testimony. Thank you, Chris. Psalm 91 is one of my favorite chapters too. Yeah. But I, I haven't experienced what you have. Not the terror by night like that, or the arrow that flies by day, the destruction lays waste at noonday. And I think how, you know, your, 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 your hope wasn't, like you said, Governments are great, and we need good government. We pray for good government, and, and it's great to have money and resources. We need that. But there, there's a time in your life where all of that can fail you. But God is unshakable. God is unshakable. You know, we don't know what the future holds, folks, but this we know, that our hope is, is, is unshakable because the source is unshakable. God is unshakable. You know, when you're going through all that, God wasn't shaken. God wasn't freaking out. He goes, no, just put your trust in me. And what a testimony again that our hope can be in Him. There is provision, promises for provision, even to come out of a country like that. Yeah. So thank you, Chris, for sharing. And uh, so good to hear that story again. Well, I'm going to go over to another person who's no stranger to you, Pastor Jess Chan, who she takes care of the children's ministry and, and does just an amazing job. We appreciate all the hard work that you do in, in every week helping children's ministry. And of course, this is happening today in other locations in the building and also happening online. So, but Jess, this year was challenging for you. E stands for this letter, eternity, that we have a hope for eternity. And I know that this past year was challenging. You, you lost two people very, very close to you, your grandfather and your auntie. So maybe tell us how your anchored hope got you through this year. Yeah, it, um, it's been a tough year for sure for my whole family. Um, earlier in April, my grandpa, who was living in a care home in Port Moody, he was definitely struggling in his health. We, we didn't know when he was going to pass, but he did end up passing away in April. And we didn't really get to be there with him because he was in a care home and it's COVID. But um, so that was, that was really shocking for the family. We had to deal with that. And we had, we had a memorial for him. We had people coming online to um, celebrate his life. And just as we were finishing up with that, Three months later, we got the shock of our lives. Um, my, my auntie in Malaysia, so my parents are actually from Malaysia, but we still have family there. My auntie, who's actually like a second mom to me, she actually fell sick very suddenly, but we really didn't think anything too serious. We, even she was still very upbeat about it. I was on the phone with her on July 1st, and we were talking, and she actually played a huge role in my faith journey with Jesus. Ever since young, she was, like I said, second mom. So she was here ever since I was born. Mm. Every year she would make trips to come to Malaysia, from Malaysia to Canada. She played a huge role in my life. And so I would say she's very close to me. So when, when I was talking with her on the phone on July 1st, you know, it was... She was still very positive. We didn't think, we, we knew, we felt she would recover. We prayed for each other. I was right going into kids camp. And within a week, within a week, mm. one thing led to another and she passed away. And um, that was really shocking because we really thought we would have more time with her. We right. really thought we'd be able to see her again, that after COVID was done, I'd have more time to connect with her. She was also, her and her, my uncle were going into retirement. We would have more time with her. But um, I think that's what was really tough about this year. I've never experienced grief the way I did this year with both of them passing away, with not being able to say goodbye the way I wanted to, mm. without not being able to tell them, you know, thank them in person the way I wanted to. 
but what really got me through. And again, <laughs> grief is a process. Everyone who's gone through loss knows that grief is a process, and I'm so thankful that I can invite Jesus in that process. But what really got me through, really, is my faith in Jesus. It is the promise of his word in Hebrews 13, 14, where it talks about how this, this world is not our permanent home. Right. That there is a home yet to come, a home in heaven. And so I'm so thankful that I can, that I can look forward to seeing them again, that I can look forward to being reunited with them. Um, and I know, I know that they're in the presence of Jesus. That is the best place to be. I know my auntie, my auntie, you know, she was the most passionate person you could possibly meet, but she often talked about how she looked forward to heaven and she would often talk about preparing our hearts for heaven. And so that really gives me peace. That's really what has gotten me through this year. Wow. Thank you, Jess. I, I, I think you got some of her passion because we see that passion coming out in your life. And, you know, I, I think your story is really encouraging because no doubt some of you watching online and maybe many of you here this past year have lost a loved one. And you, there can be a real fear creep in when that happens. And just to have our hope anchored to the promise that this life is not all there is. There's another, there's, there's a real life beyond this death's door and Jesus takes us there and we have a heaven and eternity with him that can give us comfort in those times. Thank you again. Give them all a big hand for sharing their stories and being brave coming up here today. Oh, you know, I think God has a message for us this Christmas as we go into it. He, he doesn't want us to be afraid. There's lots of things we could be afraid of, but He hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but when we're connected to Him, there's a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. We need all three of those as we go into 2022. If you look at the headlines that are on the news today, there's, and there's, there's headlines of Omicron everywhere. There's, you watch the news feed, and there's headlines about war. Is Russia going to go to war with Ukraine? There's, there's headlines on floods, on tornadoes, on global warming, on economic upheaval, increasing interest rates. And if you just watch the headlines all day long, it could really get you down. It could really bring you into a dark place. It's good to be aware of what's happening, but God wants us to be connected, and He wants us to know that as we're anchored in Him, there is a life and a light that shatters the darkness. And that's why John said in John chapter 1, 4, and 5, in Him, in Christ, was life. This child that came to this earth grew up and died for our sins. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There may be some dark things on the horizon in 2022, and there's going to be a lot of great things on the horizon in 2022. What God's saying this Christmas season is, if you anchor your hope in me, if you put your trust in me, I will light your path because in me is life and in me is light. The key is, is to be connected to Him, to be linked, to be anchored. As we saw that quote from Denzel Washington, you have to be connected to His power. And the way we do that is by believing by asking Him to come into our life. Remember what Luke said, it's been extended towards us. And today, for all those that are here in our auditorium, for those that are watching online, this Christmas message, what is it about? What's Christmas all about? It's about God coming to earth. It's about God reaching down to mankind. You know, when a child is afraid, it'll reach up its hand to mommy or to daddy. And, and of course, you'll see that parent has already reached down to that child. God's reaching out to you today, and He's saying, take my hand. I'll guide you. I'll light the way. Just like these stories you've been hearing this morning, God is able, cares about you, and He'll take you through. So, I want to close in a prayer here this morning. And we want to sing a blessing over your life. We feel like this year we need, just need to declare a blessing over all those that are watching and those here present today. Maybe you've never connected with God, or maybe you need to reconnect with Him. That link was broken somehow. The way we do that is by simply asking God to be in our heart, to receive what He's done for us. So, 
around the room here this morning and those watching online, would you pray with me a very simple prayer to make that spiritual connection? Simply believing from your heart in prayer, that's all it takes. So would you pray with me this morning? Let's pray out loud. Dear Heavenly Father, this Sunday morning, I want to connect my heart with you. I need your strength. I need your power. I need you to light my way. So I accept what Jesus came to do when he came to this earth and died on the cross for my sins. I accept you, Lord, to my heart. Amen.